dysfunctional and cruel. Too often, it is a system that is designed not, all right, can we turn that down a little bit, please? Too often, it is a system that is designed not to make patients well, but to make healthcare executives and stockholders extraordinarily wealthy. There could not be a clearer example of that than private equity billionaires on Wall Street who are making billions by purchasing hospitals throughout our country, stripping all of their assets and loading them up with debt that these hospitals could never pay back. Perhaps more than anyone else in America, Ralph De La Torre, the CEO of Stewart Healthcare, is the poster child for this outrageous type of corporate greed that is permeating our for-profit healthcare system. Working in partnership with the private equity firm Cerebus, Dr. De La Torre became obscenely wealthy by loading up hospitals from Massachusetts to Arizona with billions of dollars in debt and selling the land underneath these hospitals to real estate executives at medical properties trust who charged unsustainably high rents. As a result of Dr. De La Torre's elaborate financial scheme, Stewart Healthcare and the more than 30 hospitals it owns in eight states declared bankruptcy with some $9 billion in debt. But let's be clear, Stewart's severe financial problems did not happen overnight. They have been going on for more than a decade. It has been estimated that at least 15 patients at hospitals owned by Stewart died as a result of a lack of medical equipment or staffing shortages, and that at least 2,000 other patients were put in serious risk according to federal regulators. Since 2019, federal inspectors have cited Stewart-owned hospitals over 30 times for putting patients in quote-unquote immediate jeopardy, meaning that patients died were put at grave risk or were injured. In 2014, Stewart shut down the Quincy Medical Center in Massachusetts, with the exception of its emergency room, which it shut down six years later. Today, Quincy is the largest city in Massachusetts without an emergency room. In 2018, Stewart shut down the Northside Regional Medical Center in Youngstown, Ohio, closing the only labor and delivery unit in that city for pregnant women and their babies and laying off 468 healthcare workers in the process. Last year, Stewart shut down the Texas Vista Medical Center, the main healthcare option for San Antonio's South Side, after it missed over $650,000 in payments to medical suppliers, leaving the hospital with a severe shortage of respiratory masks, among many other things. Last month, state regulators required Stewart to shut down St. Luke's Behavioral Center in Phoenix, Arizona, after they found that it had been, after they found that it had been without air conditioning in Phoenix, as temperatures soared past 100 degrees, putting more than 70 patients at risk of heat exposure. Stewart has also shut down pediatric wards in Massachusetts, Louisiana, closed neonatal units in Florida and Texas, and eliminated maternity services at a hospital in Florida. We know that Stewart has gone bankrupt. We know that several of its hospitals have already been forced to close their doors because they ran out of money. But the question that is interesting to me is in the midst of all of that, how is the main person behind all of these efforts, Dr. Del Torre, how's he doing financially? While hospitals shut down, while patients go without care, while healthcare workers lose their jobs, how has Dr. Del Torre been doing in terms of his own financial well-being? And the answer is that he has been doing phenomenally well. While Stewart was busy shutting down hospitals, the companies he owned received $250 million in compensation over a four-year period. Let me repeat. He personally received hundreds of millions of dollars 
some of which, remember, hospitals shut down, patients without care, workers being laid off, and some of that money he used to purchase this $40 million yacht. While Stewart's hospitals were severely understaffed, patients were not getting the care they desperately needed. Dr. Delatore was able to afford this $15 million custom-made luxury fishing boat. $15 million fishing boat while patients were dying. While Stewart-owned hospitals could not afford to pay for life-saving medical supplies, it had enough money to purchase a $62 million private jet and incredibly, a $33 million backup jet that Dr. Delatore and his family used for non-business trips throughout the world. While Stewart's hospitals were laying off hundreds of workers, Delatore made a $10 million charitable contribution to an exclusive prep school in Dallas that was fully paid for by Stewart Healthcare, not his own personal funds. How many of Stewart's hospitals could have been prevented from closing down? How many lives could have been saved? How many healthcare workers would still have their jobs today if Dr. Delatore spent $160 million on high-quality healthcare at the hospitals he managed instead of a yacht, two private jets, a luxury fishing boat, and a huge contribution to a wealthy prep school? Today, we will be hearing from nurses in Massachusetts and from public officials in Louisiana who have firsthand knowledge of the harm Stewart has caused to patients, to healthcare workers, and the communities, the communities in which they live. I look forward to hearing from these panelists very soon. As the chairman of this committee, I look forward to working with ranking member Cassidy, and I want to thank him and his staff for their cooperation on this effort. Uh, Senator Markey, and I want to thank Senator Markey for his leadership. He's from Massachusetts. They have been very hard hit by Stewart. And I hope that we will be working together, every senator, Democrat and Republican, to hold Dr. Del Torre accountable for his financial mismanagement and his greed. But let me conclude by saying this. Dr. Del Torre did not act alone. Who else besides Del Torre benefited financially as a result of Stewart's bankruptcy? Cerebrus, the private equity firm he partnered with, made an estimated $800 million profit from its investments in Stewart Healthcare. From 2017 through 2021, the CEO of Medical Properties Trust received about $70 million in bonuses, stock awards, and salary. How much of that compensation came as a result of its financial arrangements with Stewart? The collapse of Stewart Healthcare is just one extreme example of the damaging role, in my view, that private equity is having on our healthcare system. Private equity firms have bought up hundreds of hospitals, thousands of nursing homes, and tens of thousands of medical practices, saddling them up with unsustainable debt and stripping their assets to make huge profits for their executives and their investors. Study after study has shown that on average, when a private equity firm takes over a hospital, a nursing home, or another medical provider, the price of health care goes up, the quality goes down, and healthcare workers are asked to do much more with fewer and fewer staff. The issue of private equity in healthcare is an issue this committee must look into. We cannot allow wealthy private equity executives to treat our healthcare system as their own personal piggy bank. Healthcare in America, in my view, must be a human right for every man, woman, and child in this country and not simply an opportunity for billionaire investments, investors to make huge profits. Senator Cassidy, Senator Cassidy, I want to thank you for your hard work on this, and you are recognized for an opening statement. Thank you, Senator Sanders. For months, this committee has engaged in a bipartisan investigation into the bankruptcy of the Stewart Healthcare and the impact on the delivery of its care at its hospitals, and I would add, therefore, on the impact of the health care of the patients those, those, that those hospitals served. It was quickly evident that breaking down the management decisions of Chief Executive Officer Dr. Ralph De La Torre is essential to understand Stewart's financial problems. Stewart's bankruptcy has nationwide implications impacting more than 30 hospitals across eight states, including 
Glenwood Regional Medical Center in West Monroe, Louisiana. According to a report from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a physician at Glenwood told a Louisiana state inspector the hospital was performing third world medicine. That's a quote. Because of management decisions resulting in limited resources at Glenwood, the state had to force the hospital to operate at one-third capacity. One patient died waiting for a transfer to another hospital because Glenwood lacked resources to treat. Glenwood is also the largest employer in West Monroe and West Washita Parish, at one point employing 9% of the community. Now, hospitals like Glenwood are essential to the both physical and financial health of the communities they serve. We need to keep this from happening again. That means we need answers. And it seems the principle to give that answer is Dr. Ralph De La Torre. And this is what our bipartisan work has been about, answers for our constituents, answers to inform legislative solutions. Unfortunately, Dr. De La Torre has refused to testify voluntarily. As a result, the committee issued a subpoena in July. Up until September the 4th, Dr. De La Torre's lawyers intended, indicated he intended to comply with the subpoena and to testify. However, eight days before the hearing, Dr. De La Torre informed the committee that he would not comply with the subpoena. We responded to Dr. De La Torre explaining why his objections to the committee's subpoena have no merit and directed him to comply. Now, a witness cannot disregard and evade a duly authorized subpoena. Therefore, today, the chair and I will be asking the committee to report a resolution to authorize civil enforcement and criminal contempt proceedings against Dr. De La Torre requiring compliance with the subpoena. I thank the chair for working with me on this critically important issue. I believe our actions today are a testament to what bipartisanship can accomplish on behalf of Americans, on behalf of patients. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cassini. And again, I want to thank you uh, and your staff for their bipartisan efforts. Uh, as Senator Cassidy mentioned, our first witness is Dr. Delatore. But as I think uh, everybody can see, Dr. Delatore uh, is not here. He was subpoenaed to testify at 10 a.m. this morning. On September 4th, 2024, counsel for Dr. Delatore sent a letter to the committee objecting to the compelled testimony and declining to comply with the subpoena. The next day, the committee overruled these objections in their entirety and informed his attorneys that we expected to see Dr. Delatore today. Dr. Delatore is not present in the room at this time. So I now call up our second panel of witnesses. Panel, if you would come to the dais, we would appreciate it. Let me thank uh, all of our witnesses. We have four excellent witnesses from Massachusetts, Louisiana. We thank them all for being here. Uh, Senator Markey has played uh, a very important role in driving this investigation and has had a huge impact on communities throughout Massachusetts. So, Senator Markey, I'd appreciate it very much if you could introduce uh, our first two witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And thank, thanks to you and Ranking Member Cassidy for your leadership on this issue. Um, again, I continue to be grateful for partnering with the subcommittee hearing that we had in April up in Boston uh, to hold Stewart Health um, accountable. Uh, greed thrives in the dark, and these witnesses are bringing this story into the light. So our first witness is Ms. Ellen McGinnis. Uh, thank you for being here today. Ms. McGinnis serves on the Massachusetts Nurses As uh, Association Board of Directors. She has worked as a nurse for 35 years including over 25 years at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, a steward-owned hospital. 
Ms. McGinnis worked in the coronary care unit, in the medical intensive care unit, and for 20 years in the emergency department. So we thank you, uh, Ms. McGinnis, uh, for your testimony, uh, and uh, we very much appreciate your leadership on this issue right from the very beginning. Uh, and let's introduce the other witness as well, and then we'll uh, introduce all the witnesses, and then we'll hear the testimony. <clears throat> and the next uh, witness is uh, Mrs. Uh, Audra Sprague. Uh, thank you for being here. Mrs. Uh, Sprague served as the co-chair of the Massachusetts Nurses Association at the Neshoba Valley Medical Center since 2015. She has also served as a member of the Massachusetts Board of Registration in Nursing since 2021. Mrs. Sprague worked at the Neshoba Valley Medical Center in the emergency department for 17 years. She, alongside almost 500 health care workers and administrators lost their jobs late last month when the bankruptcy court approved Neshoba Valley's closure due to Dr. De La Torre's financial mismanagement of steward. We thank you uh, for being here. We thank all the hardworking healthcare workers like you and Mrs. McGinnis who are fighting for patients, not just in Massachusetts, but all across our country. Uh, you continue to save lives even as the resources were being drained out of your hospital. Thank you. Senator Cassidy, do you want to introduce the uh, panelists from Louisiana? Please, although they're not sitting in that order, I'm gonna ask Ms. Mitchell, Mayor Mitchell, to go first, so I'll introduce her first. Um, Stacy Mitchell is the mayor of West Monroe, Louisiana, has held this role since 2018. Mayor Mitchell has served her community for many years, previously as an alderman for West Monroe, and owning a successful business for 20 years. She also served as a, uh, serves as a board member of Glenwood, and her role on that board gives us insight into the day-to-day -day operations of Glenwood and their challenges. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture Economics from Louisiana State University. Um, and Mayor Mitchell, thank you for being here. Uh, and by the way, I trust West Monroe is doing well with the hurricane. Um, and next, I will introduce um, uh, Representative, State Representative Michael Eccles. Um, and Michael is um, uh, state representative, first elected in 2019, representing District 14, which includes Monroe and Washita Parish. Uh, representative Eccles serves on a number of important committees, including the Health and Welfare Committee, where he has spent significant time investigating Glenwood Regional Medical Center and their mismanagement. And he will bring to this table the insights learned from the Louisiana legislative sessions. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from the University of Louisiana Monroe and an MBA from the University of Louisiana Monroe. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, Ms. McGinnis, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for being with us today. Just make sure the mic is on and talk into it. And hold it close to your mouth, please. A little bit closer. A little bit closer. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Sa thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanders and members of this committee. My name is Ellen McGinnis. I'm a nurse at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center in Boston. I've been there 26 years. For the first 12 years I worked at St. Elizabeth's, we were operated by the Archdiocese of Boston. And then Cerberus Capital came along, Stewart came along, and it's been downhill since, there, since, since then. Um, we have 2,800 Massachusetts Nurses Association nurses and healthcare professionals working at Stewart Hospitals. I'm proud and honored to, to be representing them today. We hope that we can provide a unique perspective on, the, on this issue because we are the front line providers. We provide more than 90% of the care delivered at Stewart Hospitals. The, um, the, the, corporate, the corporization and commodification of healthcare is the guiding ethos of Stewart. It's the one and only priority. And it has led to horrific suffering and harm to our patients, the people who take care of our patients and our communities. The immediate and most debilitating ownership, um, impact of the ownership of Stewart was the um, Stewart's tendency to understaff units 
when, whenever and wherever they can. I spent 20 years working in the emergency department at St. Elizabeth's, and I can tell you we always struggled to have enough staff, enough equipment, enough supplies to keep our, our patients safe. The, um, probably one of the biggest impacts is after a patient is um, admitted to the hospital, they end up sitting in the emergency department for hours to sometimes a couple of days because the units where they should be admitted and safely cared for are not staffed. This chronic understaffing has resulted in preventable harm and even death. The Boston Globe just ran a front page expose highlighting some of the tragic consequences at Stewart Hospitals. This included two patients at Holy Family Hospital in Methuen who died in the emergency department because they weren't immediately assessed and they weren't monitored. And that relates directly to severe understaffing of that department. At Good Samaritan, two patients died after spending hours in a significantly understaffed emergency department. One 81-year-old gentleman came in for chemotherapy for his pancreatic cancer, and by the time staff got to him, he was dead. There were 95 patients in that emergency department on that shift and only 11 nurses. It is absurd to think that 11 nurses can care for that, for that, for that number of patients. At another Stewart Hospital, sadly enough, a 28-year-old gentleman came in. He was in an acute mental health crisis. He was placed in restraints for his own safety, and there was nobody available to closely monitor him, which is what statute provides for. And when he went into distress, nobody was there to rescue him, and he's dead. All of these were preventable. We also have seen Stewart fail to provide the supplies and the equipment that we need. Either the supplies don't come through the front door because we're on a credit hold and nobody will bring them to us. Um, also, our equipment is, it's not properly maintained. We have IV pumps and computers with battery lives of seven to 10 seconds because the maintenance just hasn't been done. During my time in the emergency department, I, I worked nights, there were nights that we didn't have any Similac or Pedialyte or even diapers. I, I can think of two separate occasions where staff went out in the middle of the night to a 24-hour store to, to get those supplies. Um, also, we frequently didn't have food, kitchens locked up. And um, I personally have given my, my dinner, my meals to patients and staff is chipped in and sent out and had food brought in to pay for patients. Um, sadly enough, sometimes babies die, new, newborn babies die, and the practice is to place the baby's remains in um, a bereavement box and take it to the morgue. Stewart didn't pay the vendor and there weren't any bereavement boxes. And nurses were forced to put baby's remains in cardboard shipping boxes. These nurses put their own money together and went to Amazon and, and, and brought the bereavement boxes. Um, gosh, there's so much more to say. I'm, the, um, probably the most tragic and what finally blew the lid off all this was the death of a 39-year-old woman who came to the hospital, had an absolutely normal childbirth, had, was, was bleeding. She um, may have been saved by a device known as an embolism coil. There weren't any in the hospital. There hadn't been any in the hospital for weeks. They had been repossessed by the vendor. She died. A 
Stewart has also caused the closure of Quincy Medical Center. I grew up in Quincy. This was very close, very close to my aunt. Um, and now Neshoba and Connie Hospital. Connie Hospital sees 30, 000, more than 30,000 patients a year. Boston EMS takes 6,000 patients a year to Connie Hospital. Where are they going to go? We, ju we don't have the capacity in Boston for this. I know we have a lot of hospitals. We also have a lot of patients. The, um, and just to be clear, we, we need not to let this happen again. And thank you for coming together. And it's my sincerest hope that you can put an end to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bregan. By the way, if you need more than five minutes, that's fine. Take seven, eight minutes if that's what you guys need. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sanders and the members of this committee for bringing this in the forefront. My name is Audra Sprague. I'm a registered nurse. I worked at Neshoba Valley Medical Center for 17 years. Steward Healthcare systematically extracted every possible dollar that they could get out of our hospital until it led to its closure 12 days ago on August 31st, 2024. Since Steward's ownership, I've witnessed personally myself uh, some firsthand devastating effects of the company's practices of reducing overhead financial to financially benefit their stakeholders and their CEO with no regards for the patients and the impact on the patients and their care and the family and our staff. Uh, under Steward, essential resources began to dwindle. Repairs that once would have been done immediately were put off and delayed. Sometimes they weren't addressed at all. For example, if you have a critically ill patient, you need IV access as quickly as you can to give them fluids and medications. And um, if you can't get it within a very reasonable small amount of time, you use what's a mechanical drill called an IO to go through the bone into the bone marrow. And, but it's mechanically powered so it goes faster and um, less trauma and pain for the patient. Our drill battery died and it's a closed system so the vendor hadn't been paid. We couldn't get one from that vendor so they had to source it from another place. We ended up getting this subpar, it was like a Fisher Price toy it felt like. It was this mechanical, like you had to hand pump it to get this big bore needle to go through the bone into a patient. It was technically, it worked, but it was ridiculously poor quality. And it's just a perfect example of Stewart only cared about the money and didn't care about what was happening to the patients. As beds broke, broke, they weren't repaired. So when our census would increase, we would have to rent beds for a long time. Then all of a sudden, we couldn't even rent the beds because we were on credit hold. So we were forced to transfer patients to other facilities because we didn't have the physical bed for, for them to lay down in, an uh, actual hospital bed. Our hospital bed, our hospital is licensed for 57 medical beds plus 20 uh, geriatric psychiatric beds. Of the 57 medical beds, by the time we closed, we probably had around 18 to 20 working beds. So working under these conditions became overwhelming for everybody, nurses, doctors, anybody in the hospital at every different level. Um, due to the chronic understaffing and lack of supplies, it became our burden to try and make up for the financial like strain that we were under. So we would keep that same level of care for the patient whenever we could by hiding the chaos that was going on outside and hiding all of the things that had to be done to get the care for that patient. And it was exhausting. It's already a very demanding job and they made it almost impossible to do. On July 5th, 2023, I had to bring my then 18 year old son into the ER at Neshoba. I knew he would be cared for well. I trusted every single person in there but Stewart had made it so there was such low staffing and didn't care about the constant pleas for we needed more staffing on overnights. Um, he was diagnosed with um, new onset type one diabetes and was in diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a life-threatening complication of type one diabetes. He was admitted as an ICU patient into the hospital, but there was no ICU beds because there was beds, there just wasn't nurses because they hadn't staffed it. So he had to stay in the ER that entire night. That night, there are two nurses staffed in the, in the ER, despite us constantly saying we needed more. And there were 18 patients in the ER that night. So no way in the world could two nurses, no matter how fast they were, how hard they were, 
no matter what, could care for 18 patients. In the state of Massachusetts, if you're an ICU patient, that you should have one-to-one -one nursing, at times one-to-two, but at a minimum, you know, it should be one-to-one -one on an insulin drip. They couldn't, the nurses there could not meet all the needs. They couldn't get to all the patients, so I myself had to take care of my own child, titrating the drip, making sure that he was getting what he needs on the critical and emergent needs that he had, being in um, diabetic ketoacidosis. The lack of overnight staffing in that ER has been ongoing. It was a known patient safety issue. Despite our local administration, our local hospital CEO, CNO, acknowledging it and wanting to support it and wanting to fill it, corporate, no matter what, they would just say no. In our negotiations that had just ended a few months before on the new contract, we wanted a third nurse on nights. We asked for it over and over, and the corporate um, negotiators were like, nope, you don't need it, you can't have it, despite everybody saying it was needed. You know, But to ensure that my son received the critical time-sensitive care he needed, I had to be his nurse that night and not his mother, and he deserved to have both. He deserved to have a one-on-one -on -one nurse and a mother there to support him. And I wasn't able to do that because I, was, I had to focus on his nursing care and make sure that he was okay. Steward's abrupt closure of Neshoba with barely 30 days notice has left our region without critical health care services. Our transport times for ambulances have doubled or tripled. Our local EMS systems are in no way going to be able to consistently meet these needs. And there was no time to build up. They just said, nope, we're closing 30 days, that's it. And we have no public transportation. There's not even ride or you know Lyft, Uber, anything near us. Maybe every now and then you can get one, but um, the closure has resulted in longer waiting times for emergency care, for essential screening tests at other hospitals like mammograms, colonoscopies, all of those things. Now other hospitals are going to have to add all of our patients that we're getting those services at Neshoba into these hospitals that they were already overwhelmed, especially in the emergency departments at the two closest hospitals to us. Um, Moreover, Neshoba's closure has left the primary care physicians that are still in place with no place to send them for diagnostic testings like x-rays, CTs, ultrasounds, MRIs. They have to go drive a half hour to get you know, any of those services if they can get in for them. It's just the steward has a pathological lack of concern for anyone but themselves. They do whatever is good for them. They repeatedly misrepresented or outright falsified information to the state regulators intending to downplay the impact of the closure. For instance, DPH inquired about the closure plan, um, what the transportation options would be in our area uh, after the closure so patients could get back and forth to appointments. In the response to DPH's uh, question, Stewart cited a company called Here to There Transport and said that they are providing 24-7 transportation. The way it was worded was completely meant to imply that this was going to solve the situation. Here to their transport is one woman named Joanne, who, and she is lovely, like don't get me wrong, but she used to provide us with uh, vouchers for patients that would need a, a cab ride home or some sort of transportation home, but she mainly does airport transport, so she needs to sleep and she's not 24-7, she's one person. And then she even stopped doing that because Steward wouldn't pay them. So she would provide the transport. and. So it's definitely not a solution for our entire community's, you know, healthcare needs. Um, you know, they portrayed us as a failing hospital with declining census to justify closure in the state, but the narrative conceals that the corporate executives have systematically deprived our hospital of essential resources for years, including not giving us consistent gastroenterology, general surgery, urologists, anesthesiologists, and as a result, Neshoba was forced to transfer our patients and for care that we could no longer provide. Um, the steward's greed has put lives at risk and their action is going to kill people. And it's left a complete hole in our community that despite the warnings and pleas, nothing's been done to stop them. They have unchecked greed across the board and it's not just a business failure, it's a human tragedy waiting to happen in our region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Freak. Uh, Representative Eccles? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Mitchell. Good morning, Chairman Sanders, Senator Cassidy, and the other members of the Health Committee. My name is Stacey Albritton Mitchell. I'm the mayor of the city of West Monroe, Louisiana. And as Dr. Cassidy mentioned, I'm also a member of the Community Advisory Board for Glenwood Hospital. And I've never expected to be here before in my life testifying before Congress. But what my community has experienced over the last year, I think, is worth your attention. 
I appreciate this opportunity to testify on the impacts of Steward Health System has had on our city, West Monroe, as well as the Northeast Louisiana region. City of West Monroe is located in Northeast Louisiana. We're home to about 13,000 residents, but our eight parish region has almost 300,000 residents. West Monroe is the home of Glenwood Regional Medical Center. It is managed by Steward Healthcare. It serves as one of the primary health access points, not only for West Monroe, Washita Parish, the eight other parishes I mentioned, as well as it takes transfers from 26 rural hospitals. During Steward's management, access to emergency care became greatly diminished and at times unavailable. This created a strain on the other healthcare facilities in our region. And when Glenwood was put into immediate jeopardy status in December of 2023, Patients seeking emergency room services had to be diverted to other facilities 10 to 20 minutes away on the other side of the Washita River from West Monroe. And the, there are reports of these individuals waiting hours upon hours and sometimes days to receive services. Even with the Glenwood ER open, there kind of became a lack of overall confidence in the care that was provided at Glenwood. And some residents chose to seek services in hospitals even further away creating you know, more stress on an already stressful situation and of, and of course more expense for a you know, kind of an impoverished region. But this also overwhelmed the other hospitals. And while patient care is the priority, Glenwood is also an important economic driver. It is the largest employer in the city of West Monroe and West Washita Parish. And before stewards reductions, there were over 1,200 employees at Glenwood and today there are approximately 750. I can't overstate to you what a closure of Glenwood would do to these employees and their families. Those who work maintenance and janitorial and clerical type jobs will be affected the most. There's a shortage you know, of these jobs in our region. And the medical professionals would likely have to go somewhere else. They would have to relocate to find employment, which would also worsen the shortage of professionals and specialists that we have in our area. In addition to the effects on the direct employees, Steward is either not paid or they have delayed in paying local vendors. Last November, I was contacted by a local landscaper asking if there was anything that I could do to assist in getting paid. He had been you know, providing the services but had not been paid in several, several months. I said, send it over. Let me see what I can do if I can help. When I got the invoice, I was surprised. It was for $72,000. And for a small business with a family and dependents and employees, that's a lot of money and could put them out of business. Now, I want to be clear that the caring employees of Glenwood, they have held that hospital together during challenging times. Their dedication, their commitment to their patients and to our community is to be commended. And this situation, though, it continues to call, cause mental and physical stress on them because they don't know if they're going to have a job tomorrow or not or what conditions they're going to have to work under. In West Monroe, we welcome outside investment. We know that good health care is a must for a region to prosper, and stewards' effect, stewards' management has had a negative effect on our efforts to attract business, residents, and industry. It is imperative that when individuals or companies invest in critical infrastructure, such as health care, that they do so in a responsible manner, and they have their patients and the well-being of all in mind. And in stewards' case, there was a failure to uphold this responsibility. And you can see the ramifications easy in West Monroe and in these other communities that have steward managed hospitals. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I also hope that you will be able to do, you know, do something will come of this because I want to ensure that nothing like this happens to another community. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Mitchell, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Eccles. Thank you, Senator Sanders, Senator Casty, and panel. Um, today is a very important step in holding those accountable in this healthcare delivery system that continue to rob from all of us across America. Only you at the federal level can make this happen. Uh, I'm going to highlight some of the, the hearing that we had in Baton Rouge uh, after a year and a half of hearing from local physicians, nurses, and other providers that there was a problem. Uh, we started to see service lines being cut for delivery in Northeast Louisiana uh, from intensive services, urologic care, um, all the way down to basic MRI and diagnostics. 
Uh, physicians called me highly alarmed that they were unable to deliver quality care, which they're used to being able to give by the, having the resources. So after about six months of hearing many of these stories, um, as a legislator, I felt inclined on the Health and Welfare Committee that we needed to have a hearing and have a, a broader discussion with the local management, which are essentially steward hired executives that they've brought in. On April the 9th, uh, I had a hearing. Now this is after the facility had been placed in medical jeopardy numerous times. Uh, numerous conversations with our Louisiana Department of Health at the time. Stephen Russo was the legal counsel there, uh, working as executive counsel in conjunction with all the other leadership at LDH. Uh, we summoned the president, the interim president and CEO, John Turton, to a, a committee meeting, along with community members, much like you've done from across America today. In that hearing, uh, we heard impact from other regional hospitals on how they had to pick up the load when Stewart and Glenwood were unable to keep up with the patient volume. They cut their, their numbers by two thirds. Uh, they testified to the fact that it was tens of millions of dollars in additional cost that they were not able to recoup. Uh, they even did service lines for Glenwood, St. Francis Hospital, one of the regional hospitals, which up until the day of the hearing had not been paid for MRI services that they were helping out this other regional hospital. Uh, LDH testified that they didn't have supplies on hand, uh, and when they came in and put them under medical jeopardy, uh, all the way down to basic dollar, two dollar supplies, things that you need for surgical care were not on hand, and patients were ended up getting hurt because of that. Uh, several members of staff told me about infections that happened with patients and patients dying because of the lack of those supplies. All this led up to this hearing where when we deposed uh, Mr. Turton, the interim CEO, he admitted on the record that Steward was solely responsible for not providing the financial resources that they needed to provide adequate, adequate care to that, that hospital. He also on the record uh, noted that because of their mismanagement, they killed and maimed patients. When the leader of that that interim leader, the steward and hired executive, admits that on the record, we have a substantial problem. When I hear my, my colleagues from across America here to talk about these deficiencies in the healthcare system, it is glowingly clear to me that the executives of Steward Health Group are healthcare terrorists. They are killing our patients, they are killing our communities, and they need to be held accountable. I think the problem is broader. Senator Sanders, you mentioned at the beginning of the hearing that there are other organizations involved. Medical Properties Trust, coupled with Steward, have facilitated a Ponzi-like scheme that to me has to be held accountable as well. Funneling billions of dollars through private equity into these healthcare delivery systems are creating criminal enterprises. I'm hopeful that this committee, after this subpoena of the, the CEO who no-showed, uh, can hold him accountable, put him in jail, because that's where he deserves to be for, for stealing this money from all of our communities. Uh, Glenwood and its employees and the people on the ground are terrific people. They've done everything in their power to make sure that the patients get everything they can, but their hands have been just completely tied. Um, this has created a massive imbalance in our healthcare delivery system in Northeast Louisiana. We're trying to keep the pieces together. But I do want to make sure, and after this panel is over, that organizations like Medical Property Trust cannot continue to fund other bad actors who are going to come right after Stewart, because this isn't the only, the only game in town. They, they've got people they've worked with for decades that they'll fund, they'll come in and have the same mismanagement. So I'm hopeful that this committee, whether through new laws or through some form of oversight, can make sure that that imbalance gets rebalanced and we put logic and reason back in the healthcare delivery system. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Representative, and thank you for your work and being here today. Uh, you know, Senator Cassidy, what comes to my mind, above and beyond the discussion we're having, Massachusetts is supposedly one of the progressive states, Louisiana, one of the conservative states, and we're hearing the same story, aren't we? We're hearing about decent, hardworking healthcare workers trying to maintain a rotten system based on outrageous greed. Uh, we're hearing communities being impacted, whether in Louisiana or Massachusetts, um, and we're seeing that all over the country. 
Uh, I want to pick up on a point that every one of you made, and that is the spillover impact that the collapse of a healthcare facility has on other facilities in the region. In Vermont, Massachusetts, Louisiana, we're all stressed in healthcare. If a system closes down, if a hospital closes down, it's not like, hey, no problem. Other people will pick it up. So maybe just go right down the list. Uh, uh, Mayor, do you want to start off? What, what, in your community, what is the impact on other facilities? Well, definitely the other two facilities in, the, in Washita Parish are overwhelmed. Uh, the ERs are full, you know, the beds are full. So not only are the patients having to wait, but the employees that work there are stressed. They're overwhelmed. Say a word on that, and, and maybe somebody else. All of you mentioned this in one way or another. You have decent people. I'm always amazed, I gotta tell you. I have had nurses in tears in my office, not worrying about their wages, but brokenhearted that they cannot provide the quality of care they have been trained and want to do. And what I'm hearing from all four of you is you have great workers, stressed out, overwhelmed. Who wants to talk about the impact of what Stewart has done on the employees of the various facilities? Anyone want to jump in? Ms. Sprague? Hi, thank you. Um, talk a little bit closer to the mic. Yeah, the, the impact for the healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, everybody is you go there and you become, for, I can speak as a nurse, you want to take care of people, you want to help people. Nobody's working this hard in this situation for any other reason. And when you have, in the emergency department where I worked, you have sick, critical patients and not enough physical people to take care of them all, you have to go to the most emergent situation, which means you know that there's some poor little elderly woman in her bed that's in pain, that's not getting her pain medication or you know, incontinent and, and needs to be cleaned up. And in the back of your head, you know that that needs to be done but you can't physically get there and there's not a, a physical time to do it. And that, those are the things that keep you up at night that you were, you're like, oh my God, that poor woman. Like, and it wasn't that you didn't want to, you just physically could not get to it because of the life-threatening things or the urgent things you have to prioritize. And it was everywhere at every level. Everybody was trying to make up for what Steward wasn't putting in and wasn't investing. We had to invest with our own work. And so I'm our, hearing... You know, that there has been enormous emotional toll on Absolutely. people who see suffering, who want to address it, and are unable to do so. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention, I was some one of you mentioned people actually taking money out of their own pockets mm -hmm. yeah. to buy necessities. Uh, Ms. McGinnis, did you want to add to that, or? Um, thank you, Senator Sanders. I I have spent the past. 12 years since we realized, it, it took us a little bit of time to realize what a bad player Stuart was. And I've spent countless hours sitting across the table from Stuart uh, at least twice a month at staffing and labor management meetings and saying, this is unsafe, this is untenable, we can't do this. I, I, I we, we represent hundreds of nurses who just, sometimes struggle to come into work, to put one foot in front of another. Um, it's, it's just, it ruins you. A lot of people who used to work full time, 36 hours a week, cut down their hours now. When people are that stressed, they, they just, they cut down their hours and they, they, they just don't feel like they can do it anymore. It's the, the, the moral injury that occurs when you're unable to do the one, the one and only thing you want to do, and that's to keep patients safe and to take care of the best care that you can of a patient, of all my patients. And but for the greed of Stuart in 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 the way they deliberately, and it almost feels malicious, deprive me of my, my colleagues, my support system, my supplies, my equipment. I'm just worn out. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cassidy. I will defer to Senator Romney. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cassidy. Um, 
uh, appreciate the, the testimony we've heard and your willingness to, to bring this to our attention in a very uh, clear and convincing way. Um, obviously, the, the events that, that took place under uh, Mr. De La Torre's management at Glenwood and other facilities across the, the country, including, by the way, five hospitals in Utah, was uh, reprehensible and never should have happened. Uh, Stewart was operating in my state from 2017 to 2023. They understaffed healthcare facilities. They didn't pay uh, for required medical equipment. Uh, they uh, failed to meet minimum operating standards. They refused to pay a number of vendors uh, to the tune of about $40 million to, uh, to uh, vendors in, in my state. Uh, and most importantly, they endangered lives. Uh, and, and it's hard to calculate precisely how many lives have been seriously affected or worse as a result of, uh, of their mismanagement. Uh, and, and clearly this kind of um, uh, unusual setting warrants careful and uh, thorough uh, federal review. Uh, HHS at the federal level is responsible for conducting oversight to, co to combat waste, fraud, and abuse. It appears that all three were involved at, at Stewart. And I appreciate Chairman Sanders and Ranking Member Cassidy for bringing the issue before our committee. But I, I regret we don't have someone here from the administration, uh, either this administration or the prior administration, to talk about, okay, what should HHS be doing? How, how can we oversee, particularly in the case of, of hospitals in, uh, in rural areas, that, that this doesn't happen? Uh, and, and is there something that needs to be done at the federal level to to make sure that, le that levels of care are being provided? Um, is there something done at the state level? I'll turn to you, Representative, which is what, what, is, what happens at the state level? Is there some state oversight where state regulators uh, uh, lacks in this regard? We, we, I, I don't know to what degree the federal regulators uh, should have been taking more aggressive action or whether they had the, the authorities necessary to do that. But from your perspective, is there something that the state can do or should do or did not do that would have prevented uh, either the, the tragedies in your state or perhaps in uh, other states like mine uh, that have been so gravely affected as well. So at the time, and thank you for the question, Senator, um, the Undersecretary, the Secretary of LDH started investigating in November of 2023, which led us up to the hearing in spring of 2024. They do have, through the medical jeopardy process, the ability to suspend or terminate the license for the facility. And that's the path we were headed down with this particular situation. Uh, some states are more aggressive than others. I mean, when you look at shutting down a hospital and the potentially hurting more people because of that, this is how both private equity and these facilities get away from get away with these schemes because they put your facility in jeopardy. They shut them down. Your community has nothing, so they suffer even more. So then they can come to politicians like you and me and ask for additional bailout money and other lifelines, which to me is part of the broader crime. So to answer your question, yes, there are pathways for our departments of health to hold them accountable. But the question is, is the pain worth more than the punishment? And, and you believe that additional federal oversight uh, is important or necessary in this regard? So I think more broadly, um, when you look at how these schemes are funded, they come through, and Senator Sanders mentioned, Medical Properties Trust. When they're fueling this private equity movement to be able to fund these schemes, then yes, there's, there's federal oversight, and it starts with the SEC. I'm shocked that a real estate investment trust can have such large ownership of a, facility, or a, a, a company like Steward. Um, that's not how REITs function. Federal law should prohibit those things. So there's a broader conversation on how you fund it, and then there's, a, a, I guess, a maybe a a less broad conversation around specifically with the Department of Health and Hospitals on regulatory environments that disallowed these types of operations to exist. Great. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, behind me are pictures from the patients who died at Steward Hospitals in Massachusetts when Stewart directed millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars away from paying their bills and into the pockets of corporate executives. Ralph De La Torre, Cerberus, Medical Properties Trust, were just sucking out 
tens, hundreds of millions of dollars for their own benefit and leaving these hospitals without the resources which they need. And dirty ICUs, patients are bleeding out, they're dying in a hallway. Sonita, Teresa, Gilberto, David, Patsy, Michael, they were amongst the patients that our nurses were just referring to. And God knows how many others whose names we don't even know. Um, we know that more than 2,000 patients were endangered by Stewart Healthcare, according to the Boston Globe Spotlight team. They were grandparents, parents, children, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, friends, community members. But for those corporations, private equity, those profits came first, meaning the patients came last and ultimately just left it to the nurses to try to deal with this situation as it unfolded. Um, and this, this was a situation where every patient meant something special to the families and to the nurses as they tried to help. Ms. McGinnis, you saw the faces of these patients. Can, yeah, you, so can, you, talk about, can you talk about these people and their families and what the impact on them was? So, so patients die, and patients become less well sometimes when they empty the when 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 they en enter the hospital, and it it's inevitable, and it's that's life. When a patient becomes less well, or they die because the resources that they need were unavailable, that's greed. And when I think back over the years of the patients I was unable to care for in the emergency department because one of the, um, the, uh, the cardinal rules at Stewart is you can never decline a transfer. You might not have a, hus uh, a bed in the hospital. You might have a 28-bed emergency department with five nurses and 35 patients. And when you get that call that a critically ill patient is coming and you say, I, I, can't, I can't possibly prepare for a care for that patient, the nursing supervisor says, well, I'm not allowed to say no, so neither are you. And then you get that patient. And it's a gut punch to know. that you won't be able to do for that patient. What you know that patient needs. Time and time again, my organization, I personally have been to Beacon Hill. I've, I've, I've talked with people from DPH, EOHHS. We've reported power outages and, um, and other failures, uh, they closed the ICU at, um, Stewart closed the ICU mid-COVID at Neshoba Valley. And when the m &A reported them for closing it, the DPH called, called corporate, and corporate said, oh no, 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 no. Our ICU was open, not to worry, even though it was dark in, the, in, in there and there were no patients and there were wires hanging out of the wall from where the equipment had been admitted, had, had, had been removed. And when the m &A called DPH and said, well, what did you find? They said, no, it's, it's open. Stewart said it's open. So then pictures were sent to DPH and said, this is clearly a closed unit and DPH did nothing. DPH is a toothless tiger, and that's why we need this to be fixed at the federal level. Every single entity that was closed in Massachusetts by Stewart was deemed an essential service. And DPH said, no, 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 it's essential. You can't close that. And then they closed it anyway, and there were no ramifications. Nothing happens. What would you have done with the $800 million that Cerberus took oh. out of the system? What would you have done with the $40 million that... Ralph De La Torre used to buy his own private yacht. What could you have done with those revenues? We, we could have had beds that work. I mean, in, in my, I work on the 10th floor of a building. There's, there are supposed to be six elevators. One of them is working. A single elevator is, is working. They gave us these sleds, so we're supposed to do a lateral transfer. If there's a fire in the building, you go to the next building. And they gave us these sleds to drag patients who can't walk. I'm 65 years old. Do you think for one minute I can haul a patient down a flight of stairs on a sled? 
This is lunacy. Six elevators and only one of them. And even that one works most of the time. I, so yes, if we had that money, we'd have a, a facility that's clean and where things function. We'd, we'd have beds for patients. We'd have stretchers. We'd have food, staff. diapers, staff. The most of all roads lead to staffing. Yeah. If we had enough staff, we could make do with missing some other things. But for every person you take away from the bedside, you increase the risk to the patient who's left left without care. Thank, thank you for being here today. You are brave, and Dr. De La Torre is a coward. Uh, Absolutely. And he, he would not come here to allow you to confront him with the reality of what he has left as his legacy at these hospitals. Thank, thank you. you. Senator Markey, uh, thank you. Senator Cassidy. I will defer to Senator Braun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Cassidy. This is just another egregious example of a broken health care system. When you can have a story like this, I just spent time with someone yesterday, and this was on an ERISA plan. I think the claim was about $4.2 million that the company had to end up paying. The provider, 875000 bucks, And then the insurance companies and another middleman in it got nearly $3 million. And the own ERISA plan had to end up paying that bill, didn't have enough transparency to actually make a decision that would have prevented it in the first place. And you know who was suing? The provider that only got 875000 bucks, and the insurance company's other middleman got over $3 million. That should never be happening in a system. I fought it my entire career as a someone wanting to offer great health insurance, took it on back 16 years ago. Proudest thing that I did was created health care consumers out of my employees. Uh, didn't think that was reasonable to have your bill, your health insurance go up 5 to 10% each year and be told you're lucky. Uh, this is part of a broken health care system that even doctors and nurses and independent pharmacists don't want to get into anymore because it's been taken over, when private equity gets into emergency rooms and gets into something, that's because it's easy cash flow. That's okay if you want to do it on something that isn't critical, if the marketplace allows it. Here, it ends up in a story like this. It ends up to where we're paying twice as much as most other countries are for health care, and in many cases, we have poor results. I give you that description of another aspect of the system that I just described. Look at how many resources are being wasted. And then you look at this egregious example, something's got to give. Senator Sanders and I have put out a template based upon competition and transparency, getting rid of the barriers to entry. It would be a far bigger reform of a broken industry than what government has attempted to do in the past and I think it ought to put the industry on notice from insurance companies to hospitals to the whole gamut. The only ones not liking the system are the practitioners that live within it, and they're not happy about how it's evolved. Is we got to do something to fix it from the ground up, or we're going to hear more of these tragic stories. Um, I got a question here. Um, I'm going to ask it. Um, let me get to it here. It'll be for uh, Mayor Mitchell. Told you about the bill we've got uh, that's going to create strong transparency. It's going to engender competition. It's going to try to chip away at this story and others, and there are so many of them that make you sick. I'm wondering if greater transparency uh, would have been helpful in the fiscal condition of Glenwood Regional. Uh, if there was more information for people to see out there, uh, do you think um, it would have uh, made it an easier navigation in terms of what you had to go through? Yes, I, I think so, and thank you for the question. 
even now, uh, as a board member, I mean, we didn't know. It, it was always presented that Glenwood was profitable. It was actually one of the most profitable hospitals in the steward system. Um, we didn't even know, and there were rumors kind of in town, maybe a summer, late summer of 2023, about some local vendors not being paid or being slow to be paid. But it really was not until September and October when it, you know, the realization of the seriousness of the issue came about. And then all of a sudden, I mean, we were in immediate, je immediate jeopardy in December. And at that point, there was, I, you know, not a whole lot that, that could be done on, on the local end of it. Um, I've been mayor six years. This is by far the number one topic that I get calls, comments, texts. People I don't know stop me in the grocery store asking, please do something about this. And it just all came to head kind of just all of a sudden. So transparency would definitely, I think, help the situation. I think until healthcare consumers who have atrophied within a broken system that many times are fearful that their own insurance plan is going to be there for them after they get the bill four to five months later, it's all got to change. And Agreed. if it's not involved with an engaged, skin-in-the-game consumer in a system that if they want to call themselves free enterprise, has to start responding. Otherwise, you're going to see this egregious issue, many others like I described, and then, yes, a system that could still be repaired will have to be run like every other country does it. Industry, wake up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Senator Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Cassidy for holding this hearing. Um, before we begin, it's absolutely unacceptable that Dr. De La Torre has defied a subpoena from this committee and isn't at today's hearing. The American people deserve to hear answers directly from him on the horrific mismanagement of steward healthcare. Uh, Ms. Sprague and, and to all the witnesses, thank you for being here. Uh, to our nurses in particular, thank you for what you have done throughout your professional careers. Um, nurses keep our healthcare system going and they save patients every day um, and they comfort patients every day. Uh, and we are very, very grateful to you. Uh, Ms. Sprague, I want to discuss your experience at Neshoba Valley Medical Center, which is located in Massachusetts, just about 10 miles from the New Hampshire border. Um, and Southern New Hampshire Medical Center in Nashua, about 18 miles away, is uh, likely to be one of the healthcare facilities that now has to absorb the impact of the closing at Neshoba Valley. Um, when Neshoba Valley Medical Center announced abruptly at the end of July that it would be closing in August, leaving just a month for patients and staff to prepare for this massive change in their community. Um, I am curious about what patients and staff at Neshoba were told in the weeks leading up to that closure. From Stewart Corporate, very little. Yeah. We got the Warren notice that was sent to the MNA that wasn't right. sent directly to each of the employees because they don't have to if you're a part of the union. Um, so that's how the notification came of the closure to begin with. Uh, we, that was on uh, July 26th. On August 2nd, so five days later, we got, well, five business days, so a full week later, we got the first email from corporate Octavia Diaz that said, you know, pretty much I'm sorry, like, you know, we tried, but we're going to close anyways. It's not our fault. Nobody bid, which everything was done in complete secrecy. They kept saying no viable bids, no, but nobody knows what that means or what that entails. Um, and they just closed. There was, we had a town hall meeting, which is like a, we did it by phone with our CEO, but even they weren't given a ton of information from corporate. And that's it. We never had another interaction from corporate to all of the employees yep. like that was sent to us. Everything's closed now. Some of the Doctors have left, like the specialists, the endocrinologists have left. I know about it because I work in the hospital and I know like what's going on as being part of one of the co-chairs of the union. But I have never gotten a letter from the hospital saying that there's no longer a diabetes and endocrine center. Right. So a lot of people don't know, right. you know. And I know that there's nothing in check for them and how they got here. I don't understand because... If I don't do my job, there is a very strict system that will 
pluck me out of practice to keep patients safe. Right. So how private equity comes in and just can do all of this to all of these people with no systems in place, it, it, it's crazy to me. Right, because patients are gonna have to travel farther, farther. to receive care in our region. Um, it puts a massive strain on nearby hospitals and local EMS, including, as I pointed out, in my state. Yeah. Um, can you speak just briefly? I want to ask you two things. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the impact that you have seen or you're hearing from your colleagues in the nursing profession on other hospitals in the region as they have to work to absorb hundreds of patients from Neshoba. And then also I understand that you all tried to push back and protest the closing, and I'm curious about how Stewart responded to that. Stewart had no response to it at all. We never heard anything from them. They just went on with their day and uh, because I don't think that they care at all. It was of no consequence to them of what they were doing to every employee and every person that gets care at our facility, how it was at every level going to affect them. And people had no transportation, no way to get there. They had no knowledge of it. And I guess there's some helpline that's set up for, I don't know, a few hours a day, but I'm sure it's wholly inadequate if, if Stewart is in charge of, of setting it up. And they just had no help and no time because they wanted to get it done in 30 days because then it's less debt, less money that they have to spend to keep this hospital open. So there was no time to increase the staffing for all the EMS, all the towns. Most of them have one or two ambulances, aren't staffed. Now right. their transport times are double, triple to get someplace so they're out of service much longer, meaning that there's not another ambulance crew available for the people in that town. And most of them are also the firefighters. So now you don't have firefighters in town for that. And the other hospitals around are having to absorb the patients. Sure. And then as the employees who have lost our jobs, now we have to go work in that setting where they're overwhelmed because how far can we go? You know, we're not going to drive right. hours and hours to go where these hospitals aren't affected. So now I have to go work in an emergency department if I want to stay in ER nurse, which I do, that's more overwhelmed than it was before. And so it's just so multi-layered that and it's things you don't even think of. You're like, oh my gosh, even a month later, I'm like, I didn't even think of that. Like, you know, yeah. and they don't care that nobody in our area, 16 communities that are serviced, they have literally nowhere to go and it will cost lives. And they know the state and they know it's wrong and they know that Stewart lied about everything, everything always. And they still got to just do whatever they wanted. I don't understand it. Well, thank you. Um, I'm over time. Um, I want to just comment to Ms. McInnes. Um, I had a question about how things have changed at St. Elizabeth's, and you've already answered that multiple times. But Mr. Chair, as somebody uh, with family in the Boston area, I just want to say that St. Elizabeth's used to have a reputation as being a wonderful, wonderful hospital, especially for uh, moms and babies. And to hear your stories, um, shakes me to my core. And I thank you for being willing uh, to share it. I thank all of the panelists for being able to, as Senator Markey pointed out, be brave enough to be here today when the person who should be here today is not. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Hassan. Senator Cassidy. Hey, Mayor Mitchell and Representative Eccles, I want to um, enter into a conversation with you. Mayor Mitchell, you were on the community board. Did they ever show you financials? Financials were passed out each month. Um, I'm not an expert in healthcare finance, but they were passed out every month, and it did show um, that the hospital was profitable. Now, was it profitable on a, on a margin, or was it profitable like, oh my gosh, you got some operating capital here? It was, I think, more um, marginal. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm struck, and this may be for Mr. Eccles, but, but we're hearing that, that they never went on divert in Massachusetts that they would accept a patient for transfer even if they didn't have a bed. That's correct, yeah. uh, But it took our health and hospitals to make them limit their, now I'm a physician, I know that's because you didn't have staffing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have staffing but you're still taking patients, then you're putting the patient in danger. I'm just gonna say that. Did they ever discuss why they would not limit their number of beds without the state making them do so? Because presumably staffing had become an issue uh, and that's why the, the state limited it. When I first called LDH, which would have been probably late October, December, or November, telling them we need help, I was told it was a private industry, private business, free enterprise, and until certain types of complaints were made, that there really wasn't a lot that could be done. 
um, an extremely helpless situation, knowing that you know things were not great in the hospital. And it took, I think, a different type of complaint. I think a patient or maybe a physician made a complaint to LDH, and it took that to get LDH to send surveyors to Glenwood to assess the situation. And the specific complaint was about staffing ratios regarding the paucity of equipment? Tell me. I think it was more about the lack of supplies. Lack of supplies. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Representative Eccles, uh, one of the things I'm interested in is a lease arrangement between Medical Properties Trust and the hospital. Um, and I think you've reviewed some legal proceedings which have taken that which would otherwise be proprietary and has now become public. Uh, what, were there market rates being paid for the lease or were there above market rates? Can you give us a sense? Because I'm trying to, where is the hole in the bottom of the bucket? They're making it, money even on the margin, and yet there's some hole where the money's dripping out. I think it all starts at the top. So as I understand it and was reported by the Department of Health, that the lease between steward and medical property trust was equivalent to $10 million a year. So a property like Glenwood, $10 million a year is an enormous amount of money. But is that market rate or is that above market rate? It's above market rate. And do you have any sense, was it marginally above, 10X above? Are you see what I'm saying? I think it's uh, at least 2X. 2X. And that's on the high end. $5 million a year would be a high lease for that type of property with the deferred maintenance and other issues. Uh, steward, which is, of course, responsible, when a REIT owns an asset, the lessor, whoever's leasing the building, would typically be in charge of making improvements to physical plant. They have to keep that for their SEC rules. So in this case, they should have been investing back in the hospital. There's tens of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance in that facility. Now, let me stop you for a second, because in our investigation, it looks like MPT has, for, for Steward in general, has through forbearance of loans or just cash, returned about $200 million to the system. And I'm trying to be impartial here. I'm trying to figure out what's actually going on. Uh, so you could argue that they were putting the money back in the system to try and float the boat. Um, but Mayor Mitchell, was there any, could you see from the community board or Representative Eccles from your investigation that any of this money was put back into that deferred maintenance, et cetera? No, you could walk in the medical mall or the hospital now and there'll be buckets especially with the rain that's come through the last couple of days, there'll be buckets in the hallway catching water because of the leaks. I was in the medical mall last week, and you had to walk around things like that to get to the facility where I needed to get a test. And, and steward executives uh, required employees, PTs, doctors, nurses, to go around and clean up the hospital, physically clean up, sweep, mop, uh, to try to prepare for this next round of uh, liquidation, I guess, as they're bringing in suitors to try to take over this lease. So let me stop you because I just was seconds left. No, May, you, got, you got time. You know, I keep on hearing corporate, corporate, corporate. Am, am, am I gathering that local decision making? Man, that that oh, you couldn't say, by the way, that we need another coil to embolize a bleeding adenoma in the liver. Uh, you had to go to corporate to get them to pay for that. So, Mayor Mitchell, <coughs> again, you're on the Community Advisory Board. Is our impression correct that local decisions had to be made corporately? Yes. And so many of the different departments got moved out of the hospital, so it was even harder to get a decision or to get a response or to get anything done. And what was the means of communication? Was it um, a kind of formal discussion, listen, here's our to-do list and here's our needs list, or was it more ad hoc? It was really more ad hoc. I mean, the community advisory board, I mean, we, we were not in the day-to-day -day operations, obviously. We're not in those decisions. It was more of a here's what's going on in the hospital uh, type situation. Well, I'm going to, uh, the chairman has generously, uh, generously allowed me to go a little bit over, but before I end, I want to thank the nurses. I used to work in a hospital which was publicly run, and always at the end of the fiscal year, we didn't have money for things, but it was the committed staff that made it work. And uh, I just, like, my heart's beating with yours on everything you've done. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Senator Cassidy. Uh, Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, do no harm. That's uh, connected to the Hippocratic Oath. Um, and Dr. De La Torre went to medical school, became a doctor. Um, I mean, it, it raises the question, how can he be okay with the business decisions he made 
and how can he stand behind them? Uh, thousands of workers laid off uh, because of Dr. De La Torre's shoddy business practices and mismanagement of Stewart Health's hospitals and, and closures. Uh, four hospitals in Massachusetts alone laying off 2,500 employees. And at a time when we're so worried about healthcare employees, you know, we're somewhere in the vicinity as, as, as many as 6.5 million uh, could leave the profession by 2026, by the end of 2026, and we have in the best, most of optimistic pipeline a couple million to replace them. Uh, and I think that gross mismanagement is not only impacting current workers' lives, but it's also affecting future potential workers, young people that would be considered going into this. Um, so Ms. McGinnis and, and Ms. Sprague, you know, how do we go about battling back? How do we reinstitute the efforts to inspire high school students who uh, might be interested in science or open to medicine uh, to get them to uh, go into healthcare, even in what appears to be such an unstable environment. And in, within Massachusetts, obviously, it's gonna be a, a distraction and a deterrent for young people to get into healthcare. I'd like to respond, if I may. We need legislation. We need safe patient staffing legislation. We need safe patient handling legislation so the equipment is always available to move patients around. And we need safe environment legislation that would make it a crime to harm a medical worker. I worked 20 years in the ER. I, I, I have lost count of the number of times I've been assaulted. Absolutely. We just don't have access to safe to lifting equipment. And any time you take a nurse takes care of more than four patients on a med surge unit, the, odd, the, uh, the odds of one of those patients dying increases by 7%. We cannot keep doing this. Five and six and seven patients, you cannot give good care. All, all the all the scientific evidence is for patients is doable. As long as we're bringing new nurses into this environment and OTs and PTs and we're making them care for too many patients, they're, they're gonna turn around and they're gonna leave. Nobody's going to stay and, and work in this environment. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we have 20,000 more nurses now than we did at the beginning of COVID. Just to be clear, there is no nursing shortage in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There is a shortage of nurses who want, who want to work in unsafe situations. I agree 100% with what she's saying. And, you know, we can't, to have healthcare in hospitals be for profit means that nurses aren't a billable service. So if you're trying to make a profit, the same amount of work has to be done at the end of the day, whether there's one nurse to do it or 10 nurses to do it. So there's no incentive for a for-profit company that's looking to get every dime out of the hospital and the, all the services to add more nurses. They don't care how your day is. They're not there to actually help patients. They're there to make money. So until it's not for-profit and it's actually for the patients, then they will put more nurses on because it's not, you know, wherever the funding comes from to help the hospital so that they can provide the correct amount of staff because no for-profit company is gonna do it out of their own pockets, obviously, because they want the profits for them. It's just they've lost sight of what it's for. We're not a company that's putting handles on buckets. Like, it's people and it's, it matters. It's their lives. It's your family, my family, and any of the people that are actually owning these companies, they'll never be in that situation because they're gonna to go to the VIP section, they're gonna be, oh, this is the CEO of whatever, blah, blah, blah. They're gonna be taken to the best room, they're gonna be taken quickly out of, so they'll never know what it's really like. Where the rest of the people that are there in their hospitals are the ones suffering from their choices. I'm out of time, but it, it, it's compelling. I mean, it, obviously, something's gotta give. Well, thank you for your questioning, Senator Hickelooper. And I think what you, the issue that you raised is if you're a young person interested in going into healthcare, do you want to walk into a disaster like that mm -hmm. at a time when we desperately need young people to do it? That's a, it's a very important point. The other point that I would pick up on is what Senator Rodden made a moment ago. 
that in the midst of everything that we're talking about today, please don't forget, we are spending twice as much as what other countries spend per capita, over $13,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. And this is what we are getting. Uh, Senator Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. This is a very important hearing. It's important because, well, we are focused on this particular company and this set of horror stories. What is happening in your hospitals is happening all across the country. I wish there, this were not true, but there are hundreds of Ralph De La Torres who are making a disgusting fortune off of withholding health care from people in need. So I just want to tell you a quick story about what's going on in Connecticut. Um, in 2016, a company called Prospect Medical Holdings that is owned by a private equity company, Leonard Green and Partners, bought three hospitals in Connecticut. Three small hospitals, Manchester Hospital, Waterbury Hospital, Rockville Hospital. You know exactly what happened. Immediately, they started stripping services out of these hospitals. Same story you're telling. All of a sudden, supplies started running short. All of a sudden, specialists couldn't be found because they were cutting them off of the rolls. The elevators stopped working in these hospitals just like they did in your hospitals. By 2018, these hospitals were in trouble. Everybody knew it. Prospect was looking for a new buyer to just flip the hospitals to make more money. In that year, in 2018, Leonard Green took $658 million in fees and dividends. As these three hospitals in Connecticut were essentially dying in front of our eyes, patient quality was being compromised. John Dankel is the managing partner of Leonard Green. There's a lot of various reports about how much he's worth, but likely in the neighborhood of a billion dollars. I mean, how have we let American capitalism get so off the rails, so unmoored from the common good, that anybody thinks it's okay to make a billion dollars off of degrading health care for poor people in Waterbury, Connecticut. A, how do you live yourself, live with yourself? But B, why do we accept that as a country? This is just a choice to decide to commoditize our health care system mm -hmm. in Connecticut, in Louisiana, in Massachusetts, in every state across this country. And we have enough data at this point to know. Quality is worse, often way worse, yes. when these private equity companies come in, and not just in hospitals, in nursing homes. Yeah. The death rate in nursing homes owned by private equity companies is 10% higher than in those not owned by private equity homes, uh, private equity firms. And so there's no mysteries of what's going on here. Um, Ms. McGinnis, I wanted to just ask you a, a simple question. You've, you've talked about this before, but I mean, let's acknowledge that every hospital has to make money, right? You have to make money in order to operate. So nobody begrudges a hospital for making decisions that allow it to make more money than it puts out. The question is this, are you making money for the purpose of providing good health care or are you making money for the purpose of making the owners filthy rich? And every decision that happens in a hospital is different if you are making money to provide good health care versus making money to make the owners filthy rich. You were there before and after. Yes, I was. So just in the remaining minute, tell us a little bit about what it was like on the ground floor before this company comes in, right? And then after the company comes in, can you feel it as an employee, the, the difference in the value system of the owners? Yes, it's noticeably different. I, um, 
used to work on, a, on an interim coronary care unit, and we gave the best care. It was, we took care of some of the sickest patients outside the, the ICU, and we, and we gave the best care. We had a one to three, a one to four ratio. I never, ever, ever in the two and a half years that, that I worked on that floor, we never had a code. And that's because we were able to rescue our patients. We had enough eyes, enough hands, a good assessments, good monitoring, enough, enough nurses around, frankly. Because the focus was because providing the focus good was, care. Yes, and when things got tight, what Caritas Christie did is they let go assistant nurse managers, and then they let go other people. They, the very last thing that they did, and they actually never did, was get rid of staff nurses, get rid of bedside nurses. They kept us well-staffed, and we took the best care of our patients. I was so proud to work at St. Elizabeth's. And after Stuart took over, it's just acts and acts and in just taking away everything, violating agreements that they made with us. They laid off all the nursing assistants on our maternity floors. Imagine running a maternity floor with no, well, I can tell you as a nurse, it's, it's an absurd prospect. They, they lay off our educators. They, they just, they, they, now they're cutting right where for, 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 um, for patient-facing staff. Whereas Caritas Christie absolutely prioritized that to the point where they stopped funding our retirement plan. They took away a lot of other things before they took anything away from our patients. Because the purpose is now to making as patients. much money to make the owners filthy rich, right? Yeah. And it's just when, you're, when there is a fundamental difference in the purpose, there's a fundamental difference in what happens inside that hospital, and that's just the reality. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Cassidy, did you want to, uh, I think we have come to the end. Did you want to have unanimous consent? Or? Yes, thank you. I ask unanimous consent. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the letter we received from Dr. De La Torre and, uh, uh, and the committee's response to that letter. Without objection. But let me very sincerely want to thank all four of our witnesses. Thank you for what you have done for your hospitals and your communities. And thank you for telling the American people uh, what has been going on with Stewart Healthcare. And I will pledge to you, and I think I speak for Senator Cassidy, is, well, we are going to pursue this. This is Thank not you. the last uh, discussion of this. And if uh, Dr. Delatore thinks uh, that uh, he is comfortable by not being here today, Dr. Delatore, if you're watching, you're wrong. This will be pursued. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, thank everybody for participating. Uh, I once again note that Dr. Ralph Delatore, CEO of Stewart Healthcare, did not comply with the Health Committee's subpoena and attend the hearing today. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from Senator K uh, Casey and from stakeholders in support of the committee investigating this matter. For any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, September 26th by 5 p.m. Uh, this committee stands adjourned.